Welcome to Concordia Church Online. Hi, welcome to Concordia's weekly message. Some of you are watching for the first time, so I wanted to take just a moment to introduce myself. I'm Richard, I'm the pastor here at Concordia. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, if you want to explore more about what's raised in this conversation, go back to the description of this video and you'll find a link there to a Bible study. I want to encourage you to download that and to continue to explore this during the week with, with your family, with some friends on Zoom. If you want help connecting with other people with Zoom, let us know and, and we can help do that for you. Uh, We've also added some singing elements to this weekly message to, to give you the opportunity to have some of that worship type experience uh, for those who feel more comfortable in these COVID-19 times uh, staying and worshiping in the context of your home. You'll also see something that comes across the screen about giving. Now Concordia, we believe this about giving. And then our giving is a response to what God's given us. We don't give to make God like us more or to, to do something for God. We simply give from our heart. And as we give, it draws closer to God's heart because God's a generous God. So what I would encourage you to do is to find a place where your heart is uh, and, and give there. Might be a cause in, in your neighborhood, a cause in your community. Uh, might be your church. If your heart is connecting Concordia, I'm going to encourage you to, to give here. And across the screen, you'll see some very secure ways that you can do that through some of our online platforms. Again, thanks for joining us today. We're going to get to those things, some of those singing elements right now. God bless you.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. You know, one of the things that's really bugged me about church in the past year is how political it seems to have become. Not all churches, certainly, but, but a lot of churches. And, and a lot of church leaders and parachurch leaders uh, kind of getting behind one candidate or another as if that particular candidate is anointed by God and the other one is of the devil and implying that the only Christian thing to do is to, well, vote for the right one. And then you got individual Christians ranting, whether it's privately or on social, about how unchristian or ungodly a person is for, for holding certain political views or social stances or even opinions about, like, public health issues. And now I know that's not every church, but... For me, it seems to have been the story of a lot of churches and a lot of church leaders and a lot of church people recently. And, and here's my question. I wonder how God feels about that. Anyone ever stop to ask that? 
I wonder how God feels about that. How does God feel about being a, a wedge issue that divides people? How does God feel about being used and abused for political purposes? How does God feel about having Christians at, at each other's throats over differing political viewpoints? Right. Good questions, I think, that not a lot of people seem to be asking. Here's another one. Is Jesus really like that? Is Jesus as divisive as some Christians have made him appear to be? Now, if you're not yet a believer, I want to invite you to hang in through this whole conversation today to see if God's really like the impression that you're getting of him from the way that you see Christians treating each other and the way maybe that they're treating you. And, and if you're a believer, I, I want you to use this conversation and hang in through this whole thing to think about, well, what's God really like? Uh, and whether you're speaking and acting in a way that shows the real Jesus to other people or whether you're giving the impression of, of a God that ends up pushing people away at the very time God's inviting them and drawing them in to, to explore. And here's how we're going to get there today. Remember that in Jesus, we can see God. That in Jesus, the invisible becomes visible. And that means that as we look at Jesus, we see more about what God is really like. So today what we're going to do is we're going to get back into the life of Jesus and look at one of the first events that's recorded right after the birth of Jesus after Mary wrapped him up and laid him in a manger, after the shepherds came and saw this baby Jesus, after all that, after that first night, we see the wise men appear. And, and the wise men appear from somewhere far to the east of where Israel was, and they come to honor Jesus. We find that recorded for us in Matthew chapter, tw chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. So what is this event from very early in Jesus' life, when he's just a little child, less than two, maybe even a lot younger than that, what, what does that show us about what God is really like? And why did God nudge these wise men to come and see Jesus? Well, let's start by looking at the people that the text calls wise men. 
Again, Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Wise men. Now, what's their likely origin and occupation? The text just says it's wise men from the east somewhere. Well, there's been a lot of scholars who kind of been looking into that and have a bunch of different ideas. Um, many suggest the area of ancient Persia or Babylon. Some suggest maybe it was Arabia. A few say, hey, maybe it was as far as, as China. Uh, all agree that they were very well-educated scholars. Uh, certainly, they were scholars who were studying the stars, studying the sky, uh, astrology and astronomy, perhaps both. Um, they were also familiar with ancient prophecies from a bunch of different cultures, especially things having to do with the stars, which they were really interested in. It seems they were probably also had uh, some knowledge and dabbled in math and maybe medicine and even religion. Now, if they did happen to come from Persia, as seems maybe very likely, uh, they probably had some sort of a Zoroastrian influence, um, which would mean that while they didn't believe in the same God as the God of Israel, they did have some familiarity with the concept of one God, uh, not a whole bunch of many different gods. But we really don't know that. They also might have just thought like most of the people in that day and age did, that there were a whole bunch of different gods with all sorts of little local jurisdictions. We just don't know. Um, again, they may have had some moral code sort of similar to the Jews, but they may also have been like most of the people in the ancient world who as a matter of habit and practice just simply did a lot of things as normal that were really big no-nos uh, according to the Ten Commandments. Uh, again, we just don't know. The, the point is we have some good guesses as to their origin, but we don't know exactly who we are, but we do know this. And this is the big point for helping us to see who God really is. The wise men were not Jewish. They weren't Jewish, nor were they at this point in their journey believers in the one true living God. Um, and while they were probably familiar with the Jewish faith and their texts in, in a general way, they had their own religion that they followed. Now, at this point in time, almost no one other than Mary and Joseph and, and maybe the shepherds had even the remotest idea that Jesus was God. I mean, he looked like every other kid. Uh, but if they had known that Jesus was God, this would have been a very radical, almost unthinkable proposition to them. That God was inviting Gentiles to come and worship him. All right, see, for normal church-going Jews, that just wasn't done. All right, there were laws about contact with Gentiles and about what was acceptable and about what was not. And the things in their minds that most Gentiles said and did weren't really appropriate for church or for church people. And church people were very concerned, well, we might become polluted or we might become corruptive if we hang out with them or even if those people worshiped with us. We, we just can't have that. Or, and they said, well, even if we were to accept them on some basis and were to, they were to have, well, maybe some privileges in church, these, these Gentiles needed to follow the right steps first. And they were really hard, right? especially for men. Uh, in, in short, by Jesus' time, most church people had started thinking, well, God's just for us and for those who are like us, or at least sort of like us. And if they're kind of like us, they're willing to do the things to become a little more like us. All right, church people were thinking there are definite walls, boxes, lines that you don't cross. And, and God says here, wrong. Wrong. I, I'm not like that. And you shouldn't be either. Right? 
God's not exclusive. Here's the big point for today. God is inclusive. God's inclusive, meaning he invites all people, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, no matter what they've thought or what they've done to come into a relationship with him. And he demonstrates that right from the beginning of Jesus' life by inviting Gentiles to come and to worship Jesus. Now, to understand just how radical a concept that was to good church people in Jesus' day, I want to ask Alex, our family life minister, to demonstrate a few things about how Jews and Gentiles didn't generally occupy the same space, and they most definitely didn't occupy the same worship space. When God created the world, he made people. Just people. He didn't make a group of special people and a group of people that weren't special. He just made people. Now look at these two magnets. They look exactly the same. I mean, that's how God sees people too. And if we notice another thing, these magnets like to be together. And that's how people should be too. Now, over time, people moved away from each other. People hurt each other. People started to trust each other less. They started to turn away from each other. By the time we get to Jesus' day, the people that lived around the same place that he did saw the world in two different ways. Us and them. They had rules. They couldn't be around each other. They couldn't eat meals together. They certainly didn't go to church together. And generally speaking, they just pushed each other away like these two magnets are doing. That's not right. But that's the world that Jesus grew up in. And that's the world that we see addressed in the story of the wise men. Thanks, Alex. That, that was really helpful. I mean, do you guys got it? It was totally radical for church people in, in that time to, to get the impression that God's inclusive. All right, all right, they just didn't operate in that same space with people who weren't like them. Now, and now in their heads, they kind of knew that, that God was inclusive. They did have some Bible on that, but, but it just didn't sit right for most of them. Perhaps in part because they had a wrong understanding of what it meant to be inclusive. See, when they heard inclusive, what most people heard, church people heard was, well, the rules don't matter, that everything's okay, that there are no rights or wrongs. And that's not what God means by inclusive at all. all right, when I say that God's inclusive, what I mean there is that Jesus is for everyone. Regardless of race or place or politics or even how totally pure their doctrine is. Inclusive means that God wants everyone to know Jesus. And God invites everyone to know Jesus. And God is so gracious that he's the one who actually initiates that contact. He starts right where people are, even if you'd say that's a really wrong place. And then he nudges people ever closer on their journey of, of finding Jesus and coming to know Jesus and wanting to worship Jesus. There's a number of things I see about that in this text. First of all, uh, there's evidence that God planned this for a long time. There are a bunch of ancient prophecies, promises that, that took place, that were written down hundreds and hundreds of years before the wise men ever showed up on the scene. Uh, Psalm 72, beginning at verse 10. May the kings of Tarshish and the distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring, pre present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and the nations serve him. And then even an even clearer hint of the wise men in Isaiah 60. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Vast caravans of camels will converge on you. The camels of Midian and Ephah, the people of Sheba will bring, listen to this, gold and frankincense and will come worshiping the Lord. So that's there hundreds of years before the wise men ever showed up on the scene. It's obvious that God saw that coming, that he planned for it to happen. How did the wise men 
get in on that? Well, let, let's just suppose maybe that they did come from the area of Persia or Babylon. Uh, you know what? Bible got to Babylon in the time of the exile when the nation of Israel was overrun by a foreign power and many of the survivors were brought back as slaves to that region. The Israelites went there as slaves, but they brought Bible with them. Right? And non-church people in that land, quite far and distant from Israel, became familiar with some of the texts of the Bible. And God wanted that to happen because God wasn't just for the Jews. God was inclusive. That, that's who he is, meaning God's for everyone. And the second thing I see here with the wise men is that God actually invites those who are far away to explore who he is. Invites those, and then key word, to explore. They don't know him yet, but God invites them to explore who he is, um, even if they don't know that, that he's inviting them. And, and frankly, I don't think the wise men at the time knew that God was inviting them. Uh, they were just following their scientific and multicultural curiosity. But that's what God was doing. God was there working behind the scenes to invite those who are far away to explore him, even if they didn't yet know who he was. And why? Again, because God's inclusive. God wants everybody to know Jesus, no matter who they are or what they believe right now. And, and so behind the scenes, God's just kind of keep working and setting the table and nudging and nudging and nudging and, and preparing the signs so that even, even if they happen to have a lot of what good church Jews would consider wrong thinking. And then the third thing I see there is that as God's been setting the table and, and, and putting those, that sign of the star in the sky, God actually starts where people are, not where they're going to be. Right? God starts where people are and he uses what people already think or believe or how they act, even if it's wrong, as a starting place. As a starting place for a journey of exploration that's going to bring them closer to Jesus. Then the wise men, uh, in, in their case, a couple of things going on there. They were familiar with a lot of ancient texts from, from a lot of different cultures, especially texts having to do with stars. So they at least had a very passing familiarity as they headed toward Jerusalem with this Numbers 14, 17 text. That's what pointed them there. I see him, but not here, not now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will arise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. So they know those texts and they see this star and they're like, ah, Israel. Let's head that way. Then, then we get the impression that they're spiritual people. Okay? And, and, they, and they knew which of the texts that they were reading were, were religious texts. And while they didn't believe in the same God as the, text, the one these texts were talking about, uh, when something this big, astrologically and astronomically, shows up, they're like, they're ready to go see who was behind it. They wanted to see if there was something spiritual going on, because they were spiritual people. And then, as we said before, they're scholars too, right? So they're full of intellectual curiosity. And that made them interested in making new discoveries for themselves. So when this special star appeared, they wanted to check that out and say, well, who's this king that the special star is for? And, and what's he like? And what, if anything, is it going to mean for me? And God used all of that to get the wise men started on a journey to Jesus. Ordinary, everyday, even you might say non-spiritual things like, like curiosity and interest in other cultures and a, just a general spirituality. And God used those things to, to get them closer to seeing Jesus, even though they weren't Jews, e even though they wouldn't have fit in with regular churchgoers, even though they weren't yet believers. And, and that's another really radical concept. So let's just pause and reflect on, on that for a minute. Whether you're a believer or not, kind of reflect on this. 
What's got you curious about Jesus right now? And, and where would you like to know more? That curiosity, uh, that, that starting what people are wondering about Jesus and using that to kind of nudge them toward a, a further journey, that's part of how God operates in his being inclusive, in, in God wanting everybody to know who he really is and, and what he's really about. I mean, God planned for people who didn't know him to, to seek him and find him. And, and God invites those who are far away to explore who he is, even if they don't know that he's inviting them. And God starts where people are, not where they're going to be. Why? Again, because God's inclusive. That's why. And he's so inclusive. Get this. I see this fourth thing going on, that God actually assists people in finding him. And it actually helps them take the final steps to get where they need to go, the, the place where they can see Jesus and can start to worship him. Let me take you back into that text from Matthew. I'm down at verse 9 now of chapter 2. When they'd heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Now, was that really necessary? The star showing up again? I mean, apparently the star had sort of pointed them in the general direction of Palestine, right? Ooh, this, this special star means that something is happening in the land of the Jews. But the text doesn't really say that it, that it actually led them to Jerusalem. In fact, I kind of get the impression as they're going to Herod to talk about all this and they show up first at Jerusalem that, that maybe all the star initially did was say, well, head this way. Head toward Israel. That's where the, the star is rising, that Numbers 24 thing. And, and then when well, they get to Herod and they tell him the whole story and then they ask for a little more information because they only knew a little Bible, not a lot. And Herod's Bible scholars come out and they say, hey, Bethlehem is the place you're looking for. And by the way, you're, you're in luck. They're, it's just a few hours down the road. So off they went to Bethlehem, a, a two-hour walk or so down a well-marked road. So, uh, and it's at this point that the text says the star came out again. And the star actually started leading them to the exact place where Jesus was, right to the very house, in fact. Now, now these guys had come hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles through territory that wasn't always really well marked. And did they really need a, a special guide for that last little two-hour walk on a well-marked road, and Bethlehem's really not that big a place. When they got there, couldn't they have just like knocked on every door and, and, and looked for the one that they were searching for instead of asking, needing a star to guide them? You look at that and say, yeah, perhaps, but perhaps not. You see, by nature, there is something inside of us that, that keeps us so stuck on ourselves that it's really impossible for us to find God on our own. That's why in our day, God sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts to, to lead us to him, to show us the way. That's why here, he, he had the star show up again to lead the wise men right where they needed to be, right so they could see where Jesus was. And maybe that's why the text says, let me take you back there again, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They're not like, oh, what's this dumb star doing here again? Very literally, when it says overjoyed, it says they, they rejoiced with an exceedingly great joy. Like joy, 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 three words for joy when one when, when, when sufficed. They were really excited. They were really excited to see the star again, perhaps because the star showing up told them, this really is big. 
All right, this, this is huge. Here's that star again. And this time it's not just like showing up. It's already pointed us here to, to Israel, but it's actually leading us. It's, it's not just appearing in the sky. It's actually guiding us on and, and leading us to the place. And stars don't do that. So, so maybe God must be involved in this. And, and maybe this child that we're looking for is more than we actually thought. Yeah. And he was, wasn't he? Jesus isn't just a child. The child is also fully and completely God. And God's always working to assist people to see that, to assist people to find him. Why? God's inclusive. That's why. And he wants everyone to see Jesus for who he really is. Now, as they come close, I want you to notice one more thing here. Number five, that God accepts people as they are first. And then accepting them, he changes them a step at a time and in his timing. God accepts people just as they are. And that's why Jesus didn't throw a crying fit when these Gentile wise men showed up who as Gentiles really didn't belong. And, and it's why Jesus' parents didn't turn him away either just because they had different views and beliefs. And it's why that star didn't have some laser beam coming out of it that said, oh, stop right there. Uh, leave your gifts at the door, but this far and no farther because you don't belong. You don't really fit in. You're not one of us. There, there's none of that there because God is not like that. Right? God is inclusive. And so he invites them in to see Jesus. And get this, because this is really important. It's seeing Jesus where the change in them really starts. Again, let me take you back to what Matthew wrote. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. Now, why would they do that if seeing Jesus didn't change something in them? Remember, these are big, important people. Rich, probably powerful, um, scholars, intellectuals. And I'm sure these wise men must have been wondering as they start going through the neighborhood that the star is leading them through, like, I'm sure they must have been thinking, um, is the star's GPS off or something? I mean, this has got to be the wrong place. There's, there's got to be more than these humble surroundings and this little rented house and a kid without any slaves or servants or guards. But then they saw Jesus. Then they saw Jesus, and instead of pulling out some little, well, this will do, trinket, after we've all oh, we've come all this way, uh, but this isn't what we expected. They opened their gifts. They opened their gifts and freely and willingly and joyfully gave them the best that they had. Because seeing Jesus changes people. Right? See, the kind of change that God wants doesn't start by thinking like church people. It doesn't start by becoming like church people. It doesn't start by joining church people. All right? There, there's no sign that the wise men were interested in any of that at this particular time. The wise men just wanted to see Jesus, which, which they did. And that's where the change starts. All right? Change starts when you see Jesus for who he is even if he's not what you thought that you were looking for. And while they didn't yet know all of who Jesus was or what he'd come to do, they were closer. They were on their way. See, God started where they were. And he helped them get to where they could see a whole lot more. God got them to see Jesus. Not church Jesus, but Jesus, Jesus. 
And, and while the Bible doesn't tell us the rest of their story, there's a lot of tradition that says they ended up becoming Christians, which, which never would have happened if God had treated them like we tend to treat people today who look or think or act differently than us or who have different viewpoints or political views than we do. Even though we know better, we, we tend to be kind of exclusive. But God's not like that. God's inclusive. God wants people to find him, and he planned for a long time for that to happen. God invites those who are far away to, to search for him, to explore. God's gracious enough to start where they are, not, not where they're going to be. And then as they get closer, God actually assists them in taking those final steps and, and, and finding him. And then... As God accepts them, he changes them one step at a time. And change is important, right? God is so gracious and, and so inclusive that he starts where we are, but God also doesn't want us to stay where we are. He wants us to keep growing in our relationship with him and, and seeing a little more clearly who Jesus is and letting that affect how we live and how we love with other people. But you get to the change part by starting where God does, by being inclusive and accepting people at the start right where they are. Let's pause and reflect again because it's really challenging. All right, in today's climate, what's hard for you about starting where people are and allowing them to change one step at a time. And why is that? Big idea from today's conversation Jesus is inclusive, which is quite challenging, uh, not in theory, but in practice. Because in the polarized world that we live in right now, there seem to be purity tests for everything, even in the church. And that means that, that sometimes we treat others in the church who have different viewpoints than we do quite harshly sometimes. Um, but if God, who is perfect and whose viewpoints are 100% correct, finds a way to be inclusive of those who, whose lives and viewpoints are not, then shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? And if we can't figure out how to do a better job at that, does that really show other people what we want them to see about what our God is really like? Slow down and, and think about that for a moment. And then think about this. How do those purity, te purity tests also affect how we see and treat people outside the church? Are, are we sometimes a little standoffish because we want them to be a little more like us before we'll accept them? I think the same questions apply. If, if God, who is perfect and whose viewpoints are 100% correct, can, can find a way to be inclusive of those whose lives and viewpoints are not, Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? And if we can't figure out how to do a better job at that, does that really show other people what we want them to see about what our God is really like? Yeah, change is important, right? Change in thinking, change in behavior. God wants both to be happening in our lives whether we already know him or whether we're just starting to. 
But, but God is so gracious and inclusive that he starts not where we're going to be, but where we are. It keeps nudging and drawing us closer and then gently and patiently nudges us where we need to be. Guys, if, if God's okay with that, then maybe we can be too. Now, this is challenging territory. And, and I think we're going to need a lot of God's help to get us back to God's heart and, and to show his true heart to other people. A lot of thinking, a lot of praying, a lot of confessing, a lot of repenting, a lot of reflecting, a lot of one step at a time changes in behavior. So today, because it's so challenging, I, I just want to leave you with some questions and challenges to start you thinking about that process. Jesus is inclusive. So how will you start living that out in your community? Jesus is inclusive. So how will you start practicing that in your church? Jesus is inclusive, so how will you not only speak love, but, but show and live love to people that you think or feel really don't fit in, or to people that are in, but they don't meet your standards, or they don't agree with your viewpoints? And how are you going to invite Jesus to help you with that? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.